Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today's review will be something a little bit different. Whilst I love Metal Fight and those videos will still be coming, don't worry. I don't want to just cover Metal Fight, I want to delve into every aspect of Beyblade I personally enjoy. And that brings us to today's review on the series that started it all. But before we begin, if you enjoy Beyblade content and you want to see more videos like this on the channel, do me a favour and smash that like button and subscribe. I release videos on a weekly basis and your support truly helps the channel grow. And if you don't like your stare, still hit the like button since YouTube have gotten rid of dislikes for some reason. This is my review of Bakuten shoot chapter 1. Let it rip. Now the chapter opens along the infamous riverbank where Tyson and Kai had their initial battle in the anime. Whilst we aren't shown what exactly happened beforehand, it's implied that Tyson had got into a scuffle with the bully Billy, the latter walking away with Tyson closely pursuing him. Standing between them both, we see a tall figure wearing a cloak. They honestly remind me a lot of the Dark Bladers to be honest, and as Tyson barges past his sights set on Billy, literally out of nowhere he is forced to the ground, the stranger in the cloak essentially uppercutting him. Understandably frustrated, Tyson confronts his attacker, only to be scolded over his impulsive nature. This person teaches Tyson about the values of Beyblading, and right away I'm questioning how they're related to Tyson. Are they merely passing by, or is there something more going on here? And I think that's why this opening scene is so effective. Not only does it provide a great introduction to Tyson on the surface level and what he's all about, it plants the seeds for what's to come hooking the reader in. You don't know who this strange individual is yet, but you want to keep reading to find out more to see what role they play in all of this. Before we could get any more answers from the stranger, he abruptly vanishes, but not before giving Tyson his blade, the Beyblade we will come to know as Dragoon. Keen on getting some answers, Tyson enlists the help of his good friend Kenny, or the Chief as he calls him. Unfortunately however, their searches come up empty handed. At face value, according to Kenny's data at least, there's nothing inherently special about this Beyblade. Upon taking a closer look, Tyson finds the image of a blue dragon within the blade's bit chip, this revelation seemingly having an effect on him. In the panel, Tyson is surrounded by what looks like either lightning or shattered glass in the background. It's hard to really say. What is clear is that Tyson and Dragoon appear to connect for the first time, with the former noting that he can feel a strange power rising up from inside when he looks into the Dragoon, intent on using this power to defeat Billy. Kenny on the other hand crushes his dreams immediately after, as the analysis on Billy's Beyblade shows that the weight disc had actually been modified with a heavy metal alloy, granting far greater endurance and defence than any ordinary Beyblade. I do find it interesting that Carlos takes Billy's role in the anime. In the adaptation, Billy was a minor character to introduce the concept of Beyblade for his brief match with Tyson at the start of the episode, rather than an antagonist or even a member of the Blade Sharks or however brief his appearance was. In the end, I do think Carlos is better suited for this role, as he just gives off the vibe of a scumbag where Billy fails to do so. Showcasing his ingenuity as a blader, Tyson already came prepared with a strategy. By sticking two ripcords or shooter racks together, he's able to increase the torque of Dragoon's rotation in order to blitz Billy's with a rapid attack strategy. In theory, whilst this method would double Dragoon's rotation speed, to even stand a chance against Billy he would need to once again double the torque to a total of 4 times, something he can't do as Tyson's unable to make the ripcord any longer. From a tree above the part, the cloak being from before watches on, noting that Tyson has grown since the last time he saw him, although he still possessed the enthusiasm of a child. This again has me questioning their intent, and how they even know Tyson in the first place. Once they remove their cloak however, it all made sense. Their identity is revealed as Jin of the Gale, or in other words, Hero Granger, Tyson's older brother. I honestly don't know what to think about this, and it makes me question why his debut in the anime wasn't until the final season, if he plays such a prominent role in the manga from the beginning. Moreover, what has he been doing for all of this time? In G Revolution, we know Hero had been absent from Tyson's life for such an extended period of time, he wasn't able to recognise him initially. Will that still be the case here, and why does he have Dragoon? So far, it seems as if the manga will prove to be a completely fresh experience compared to the anime, and if that that is the case, I'm extremely excited for that. Hero seems to be a fan of the cryptic lessons, launching his blade from the vantage point towards the two, barely missing Tyson in the process. The Beyblade ricocheting around him at high speeds, it's moving so fast that Kenny compares it to that of a shuriken, capable of sending Dragoon airborne with a single blow. Before either of them had any chance to react, the assault ceases, and Tyson notices something peculiar as Dragoon descends back down to earth. Due to the momentum of the fall, Dragoon's rotation speed increased, revealing the answer he needs to defeat Billy. As he departs, we finally get a close look at Hero's design and he looks amazing. Whilst his armour certainly has a sleeker design in the anime, here it's definitely closer to that of a ninja. His shoulder pads are larger to cover the full length of his frame and overall he's built like a tank. Hero doesn't skip leg day that's for sure. The next thing we know we are back at the riverbank, Tyson ready to battle Billy once again, and it's unknown just how further ahead this is. Whether it's the same day or a few days later, it's never specified. Surrounding the two are a bunch of other kids here to see the match, some of them already having their blades stolen by the blade sharks. The stakes are raised as Tyson wants Billy to return the Beyblades he's stolen if 
he loses, and to his credit he does accept the challenge, but only if they all surrender their place if he manages to beat Tyson again. Whilst the others are reluctant at first, they eventually all rally behind Tyson, including Kenny who is also nervous about the prospect of having his blade stolen, so maybe he's more of a Beyblader in his version? Yeah, whilst he did battle a few times, especially at the beginning of the anime, they never really painted Chief as a blader, more so having an interest in the analytic side of the sport, so maybe we will see him in a more prominent role in that regard. I know he doesn't have a bit beast as Dizzy was anime exclusive, exclusive to the dub at that, but we'll have to wait and see. Both Beybladers take the position before this adorable stadium, look how tiny that thing is. Instead of the run up and jump strategy he used in the anime adaptation, Tyson opts for launching Dragoon straight up with extreme accuracy. Similar to Jingo's battle with Kiyoya for example, Billy believes he's already won under the impression that Tyson has essentially given up. Kenny on the other hand is able to put together Tyson's strategy, the momentum added from Dragoon's descent combined with the modified Rick card providing the blade with the necessary 4 times torque to match Billy's metal alloyed weight disc. From this point on, Billy's blade puts up barely any resistance, Dragoon forcing it around the stadium with ease, finishing the battle with its tornado attack, the force of its rotation speed kicking up a small storm hurling the Beyblade out of the stadium, including a really nice visual of the spirit of Dragoon manifesting in the background. Humiliated, Billy flees only to be called back by Tyson, forgetting his blade, which again is very reminiscent to the second chapter of Metal Fight, Takafumi Adachi taking more inspiration from the original series than I initially thought. Unlike Kiyoya however, Billy isn't as accepting but does hold up his side of the deal, returning all of the Beyblades he's stolen. The prologue for this chapter ends with the kids cheering Tyson, whilst also commenting on the scar on his face, which I assume he got from here at the very beginning of the chapter? You heard me right though, this was just a prologue for what's to come. Despite having a similar amount of pages as the Metal Fight manga, so far the pacing is so absurdly quick that a lot goes on in the span of 10 pages. In a way it does make the series feel more action packed, but in the process it sacrifices a cohesive narrative with the frequent timescapes giving chapter 1 an incomplete feel. Bikey Tun Shoot is just a lot harder to follow because of this, to the extent where I began to question whether or not I was reading the complete chapter. The story has a habit of transitioning from one scene to the next abruptly, without providing the full context to progress the narrative cohesively. I'm left questioning the events as the manga already expects you to know beforehand, however how could you possibly have that information if you don't provide it to the reader? Part 2 for the lack of a better term begins in the garden of the Dragon Spirit Sword Dojo, where Tyson lives with his grandpa. He's seen practicing with Dragoon along a plank of wood with a ramp stuck to the end. 21 cans are placed along the length with the aim of knocking all of them off in a single launch. This honestly reminds me a lot of the second season where the gang basically spent most of their time practicing like this. Meanwhile, Grandpa is searching for him as he skips out on his morning sword training so he could practice with Dragoon. Grandpa scolded him for this as he was successful in hitting every single can. As the heir of the Dragon Spirit, Grandpa wants Tyson to take his swordmanship seriously so the secret technique of the Granger family can be passed down to future generations. Tyson, on the other hand, being a dumb kid, doesn't really have an interest in any of this. More interest in pursuing his dreams of becoming a world class Beyblader. This in of itself creates a conflict between the two. Grandpa is willing to let Tyson go if he's able to strike him at least once, and Tyson naturally accepts lunging at Grandpa with a number of linear attacks. Despite the effort, it's a simple matter for Grandpa, simply repelling the assault knocking Tyson to the ground. Taking advantage of this opening, Grandpa goes to attack Tyson again, the latter noticing he was about to trample all over the garden in the process. At first, I was a bit confused as to why Tyson cared so much about this, although it did become all too clear soon enough. To stop him, Tyson launches Dragoon at the Kendo Sword with such force that it was able to split the sword in half. To be fair, it's made out of wood, hardly the sturdiest material. It's still impressive though given that this is a Tyson who isn't even able to draw out the full power of Dragoon yet. Now it turns out the reason why Tyson has such an attachment to this garden specifically is due to his late mother. As before she passed away, she loved these flowers and it's an endearing scene I have to say. In the anime, I do believe they briefly mention Tyson's mother indirectly if I recall correctly. Tyson's father says something along the lines that his mother would be proud of him during the finals in Moscow. In the manga, the outright state that she's dead, however we aren't given any inclination as to how it happened, whether it was an accident or an illness, or how long the time gap is between her death and the start of the series. Taking into account Tyson's age, I can't imagine it's been too long. Grandpa finally catches on noticing the damage dealt to his sword, amazed that Tyson did have the spirit of the dragon for his blade, realising that all of the training they did together has paid off, just not in the manner he was expecting. Distracted by his own thoughts of reflection, he doesn't see Tyson sneaking up behind him, smacking him square on the head with the sword fleeing from the estate. We are treated to this lovely scene after this, Grandpa is gazing up to the sky as a vision of Tyson's late mum forms amongst the clouds, and you can definitely see where Tyson got his looks from, sharing a striking resemblance to each other. The next time we see Tyson is during the regional tour that quite honestly comes out of nowhere. I guess this is what Tyson was training hard for but they never alluded to this at any point. Don't get too excited either since we barely see anything of note here. Tyson wins the finals of the B block, earning him a place in the finals against the winner of the A block and defending champion, Kai.
Carlos. Yes, not Kai, Carlos. Making his appearance as the second member of the Blade Sharks Tyson has encountered thus far. I actually like how Carlos is more of a big deal in this version if I'm honest. In the anime he was viewed as the bottom of the barrel not only by Tyson but his own friends as well. The Blade Sharks disowning him, destroying his blade per the orders of Kai after his defeat to Tyson. And whilst he does make an appearance in the regionals of the adaptation, he ultimately turns on the rest of the Blade Sharks in the Gauntlet Battle before losing to Tyson again in the D Block Finals. Whilst I'm comparing the two, the regional tournament in the manga is basically an afterthought, rather than a central plot point that has been built up over the course of a few chapters. There are only two blocks here rather than the five in the anime, we don't even get to see any major battles, encountering Tyson again after he's already won his respective bracket. Max, Ray and Kai are also yet to make any appearances, which is unfortunate as their participation in this tournament was the highlight of this arc in the anime version. With the finals taking place in around half an hour, Tyson enjoys a can of soda trying to calm his nerves. The chief's surprised that somebody with Tyson's confidence could actually get nervous. Kenny isn't here to participate in the originals, rather here to collect all of the data he can from the finals. They are interrupted by Carlos getting into an altercation with him after he tried to destroy some other kids blades. Tyson is able to stop him using his weight essentially ramming into him, saving the kids blade blade in the process. But this only further escalates the situation as Carlos turns his attention on him, revealing himself as a member of the Blade Sharks. A revelation that spooks everyone else except Tyson. When the referee shows up to let him know that the finals were about to start, Carlos basically threatens him, implying that accidents can happen in the stadium, guaranteeing it wasn't going to battle fairly. Now the stadium itself is simply awesome to look at, whilst it isn't the cage that Tyson and Kai battle in, this arena does feel like the precursor to that concept. The stadium has no special gimmicks or anything, just a standard tournament arena, however it's surrounded by ropes used in a boxing ring. From our viewpoint in the stands, the venue is jam packed with other bladers excited for the finals. Overall it does feel like a big deal even with the absence of any meaningful build up. In theory, the finals is set up as a best 2 out of 3 matchup, unfortunately we only get to see a single battle due to what transpires. Kenny warns Tyson of Carlos's dirty tricks and the finals begin, Tyson promising to give it his best playing fair and square. Rather than launching his blade into the stadium, in a similar manner to Tyson, Carlos launches his blade against the ground, causing it to bounce into one of the steel pipes holding the ropes together before ricocheting into Tyson, injuring his hand in the process. The damage is severe enough to the point that Tyson is unable to launch Dragoon, writhing with pain along the floor. The stadium erupts into booze with the referee questioning Carlos over his intent, and the response he gets from him isn't exactly encouraging. Meanwhile, Kenny runs over to Tyson asking him to forfeit the match, and due to the pain he does consider it for a moment. At first I thought the scene was much darker than it actually is. It's a combination of the illustration as well as the scans being grayscale as it looks like Tyson's thumb was decapitated, with a shade that I initially thought was a pool of blood. It's just swelling though with his thumb tucked into his palm. It's then he was able to recall something Grandpa told him prior to the tournament. Whilst cryptic at first, Tyson realised what he meant. By becoming one with Dragoon, he can reveal his true strength. With a newfound determination, Tyson is given the first round fire disqualification, although the manga doesn't actually tell you this. Now being unable to launch Dragoon conventionally, he positions his launcher with just his right hand, the symbol of Dragoon imprinted into his forehead. If I had to compare this to something, this reminds me of the Eye of Horus in Yu-Gi-Oh! that appears whenever a wielder of a Millennium item makes use of their power. Not only that, Dragoon himself appears wrapping around Tyson's torso, something only Kenny is able to see. To launch Dragoon, Tyson uses the ropes around the stadium as a makeshift trampoline, sending himself airborne as his shoes slip off, smacking Kenny in the face. By holding the launcher with his feet, he's able to use his entire body in the launch, like a whip crack in midair. Dragoon striking Carlos's bear from above, winning the tournament in a single blow. Chapter 1 concludes with the emergence of a mysterious boy watching over from the stands, questioning whether he's found the blade he's been searching for. Now this is where we usually cover the changes made when adapting the manga to the anime. However, for this review series I'm opting to skip out on that segment for two reasons mainly. First of all, while the length of this chapter in terms of the page count when compared to Metal Fight is virtually identical, the amount of content contained is far greater due to the non-existent pacing of the manga so far. So for time's sake it just wouldn't make sense to go through everything with a fine tooth comb, and that's why I've integrated my comparisons into the review segment itself whenever I've mentioned the anime. The other reason is that from what I can see so far, the manga seems to be going in a completely unique direction with the introduction of heroes so early on, amongst other things. So it wouldn't really fit to compare the anime to the source material, if the source material is ultimately going to be significantly different later down the line. Now if the chapters do get shorter and the plot does end up being similar to the adaptation, I will bring this segment back for the Bakuten and Shoot reviews. As it stands right now though, they will remain as staples for only the Metal Fight series of reviews. 
Overall, my thoughts for this one are a bit all over the place. Kind of like this chapter, where I think chapter 1 excels the most above all is through its character work, especially when it comes to Tyson. Takawa Yoki did a fantastic job of introducing us to him and allowing us to see the world of Beyblade through his eyes. Not only do we see several occasions of Tyson using his ingenuity as a Beyblader, but we also get to relate to him on a personal level as well through the passing of his mother. As a reader, I feel more invested in Tyson as a character than, say, Jinga, and that's simply because they open him up towards from his good traits to his flaws as well. I feel more inclined to follow Tyson to see how he matures and develops through the story, I genuinely want to see him succeed and prosper. Whereas with Metal Fight, the attraction to Jinga was through the mystery surrounding him rather than himself as a character. In a way, it's similar to how they handled Hero in this chapter. However, where this chapter fundamentally falls apart is everywhere else, and it all stems from the non-existent pacing. The prologue for this chapter itself feels like it could be a complete chapter due to the amount of action that takes place within the span of 10 pages. Nothing here has time to breathe or has any chance to be expanded or built upon. We are taken from one scene to the next with no warning, making me question whether or not I was actually missing pages. One moment we are with Tyson and Kenny at the park, and the next Tyson is facing off with Billy, it just makes me question why is it like this? Now I can't confirm this, but it feels like Takawa Yoki, the creator of the series, had a set amount of plot points he needed to introduce in this first chapter, so he wasn't able to expand upon any of it, rushing from scene to scene. This entry could have benefited a lot more from stretching Tyson's encounter with Billy into a full chapter, similarly to his first battle with Carlos in the anime. We don't even get to see their first battle either, it's only implied and that causes a disconnect that confuses the reader. I found myself finding more questions than answers, not because there are any questions present that need an answer, we just aren't given the full context to truly understand these events. The battles were also another low point. To be honest, I don't think you could even really call them that as they rarely went over a page. Hero with his blade gives more action than the three battles here combined. All in all, chapter 1 does have potential, unfortunately it just feels unfinished. Which is a shame as there are a lot of amazing aspects that this chapter does get right, especially when it comes down to the character work. But there just isn't enough substance or anything else to really call this an amazing introduction to the world of the original series. On a surface level it accomplishes what it needs to, just nothing beyond that sadly. Anyway that's all from me and as always thank you for your continuous support and I hope you enjoyed the video. Comment down below your overall thoughts on this chapter and where do you personally see this story going from here. As always take care and I'll catch you in the next one.